Well, thank you all for coming. Welcome. Um, this is Mike. No, I just done it. I can't remember. Swenson. Swenson. Of course it is. <laughs> this is Mike Swenson, and he's going to talk about the USS Arizona's last ban. And I think this is really going to be fascinating. So I'm going to turn it over to Great. Mike. Great. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks and welcome to you all and welcome to any of you who are uh, viewing this uh, presentation uh, on YouTube. And first of all, I wanted to thank Maureen Birdfield and Jamie Swenson for helping me put this together when I had the idea of, of um, making these presentations at senior centers or libraries. The first thing I thought of was the Janesville Library. I'm a Janesville native. Uh, I was in the Craig class of 69. That was the second year when we had two high schools in Janesville and not just one. And um, anyway, I contacted Jamie and I said, well, do you think, I asked her if there, she thought that there would be any interest in this presentation. So she put me in contact with Maureen and it turned out, and of course, this presentation is timely if we're doing it around the time of the Pearl Harbor anniversary. So it was timely and she happened to have a spot open in her senior moment. So that worked out just great. So anyway, thank you. And thank you also to JATV, Janesville Access Television, for producing, uh, for taping this presentation. And again, welcome to any of you who are watching this uh, on television, and including the Naval uh, Musicians Facebook group, which I understand uh, is going to be uh, given access to this so that people around the country may be listening to this presentation. Now, my topic today is the Navy field band that was on the Arizona at the time of the attack. And uh, of course, the attack was some 81 years ago, Wednesday. And uh, the, the field band on the USS Arizona consisted of 20 musicians and the band leader for a total of 21. And they were all lost on the day of the attack. Um, now, first of all, a disclaimer, I am not a World War II historian. I'm not a Navy expert. I'm not an expert on what happened on December 7th. In fact, the list of things that I'm not an expert on is quite lengthy. But um, I, uh, I became interested in this topic of the Arizona ban, and that's what led me to put this presentation together. Now, um, again, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. I'm just a band guy. When I was in school, we were called band nerds. So I guess we don't call band students or orchestra students band nerds anymore, but that's what we were. And I started band lessons when I was in fifth grade in the Middle Ages uh, with Mr. Daniels. He ran the program that was offered to the three of the Catholic schools in Janesville. And um, actually, it occurred to me that 61 years ago was my first concert. It was a Christmas concert. And our big numbers were Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star and Jingle Bells. So that was our first concert six, some 61 years ago. I started on cornet, and I played that in grade school and junior high school. And then in uh, high school, I switched to French horn. There was about 20 trumpet players in the high school band, and they had three French horns. So they needed French horns. and. Uh, I decided to make that switch. And I actually majored in music in college. And I've played in bands and orchestras ever since. I've been a freelance musician in Milwaukee and in southeastern Wisconsin these many years. Uh, and I married a noble player. So how did I become interested in the story of this naval field band from the Arizona? Um, Besides music, uh, I was also very interested in traveling, and we've, my wife and I have visited places all over the world. And one of the places we liked visiting was Hawaii, and we've been there many times. And every time we were in Honolulu, we would stop and visit the Arizona Memorial uh, in Honolulu. Um, that memorial has changed over the years a lot. Um, now it contains, of course, a visitor center. Uh, the battleship Missouri is moored there. You can tour it. There's a submarine museum and an aviation museum. And of course, you can see the presentation about Pearl Harbor at the visitor center. And then of course, you can take the launch from that location over to actually board the, uh, go on board the, the monument that spans the, what remains of the Arizona, in, which lies in 40 feet of water in Pearl Harbor. Now, the last time we were there was about four years ago. I went with my wife and my daughter and my son-in-law and of course, we went to the Pearl Harbor Memorial. Um, my son-in-law had never been there. My daughter had been there many years ago, but we went again. And, um, and this time, I spent a little bit of time in the, uh, the bookstore at the memorial. 
and I came across this excellent book written by Molly Kent, and it was called U.S. Arizona's Last Band. This is the book. And, um, of course, it attracted my attention because anything about bands was something that was going to catch my attention. So I've uh, read the book, and I became very interested in the subject. And I've read this book and reread it many times since I purchased it. Now, the, the author of the book was Molly Kent, and her brother, Clyde Williams, was a trumpet player in this band. And um, I really found the book to be a fascinating read. The book, uh, in, in the book, she tells her family's personal history, um, how her brother came to be a member of uh, this band, joined the Navy and, and uh, joined the band, what their life was like in serving in a military band, in a naval band. And she also shared a lot of information about what we were like as a country at, at that time, in the 30s and 40s. Uh, products of the, the, the Depression. Um, and some of my favorite comments that she mentioned in the book, which tell about what they were about in those days, she mentions that they, when they were young, they didn't wear designer clothing. They didn't go out and buy designer clothing. Their clothing designers was their mothers who made their, all of their clothes. Um, no one had $100 sneakers. Uh, everyone, all the kids had three pairs of shoes. One was a pair that they wore to school. One was a smelly pair of sneakers that they wore for gym. And then they had an, one nice pair for church. Um, they didn't worry about uh, what they ate. I, they ate very healthy in those days. Uh, they ate fresh fruits and vegetables in season. And then what they didn't uh, eat, they canned. And they used those when they were not in season. And she mentions that they didn't really know, they didn't worry about cholesterol. They didn't know what cholesterol was. She said that their mothers fried everything. And they ate it, and that was that. A simpler life. She talked about life in small towns in the post-Depression era, era, and how the war affected the lives of, of all of us, all Americans. Now, her source materials for writing this book were included letters that her family received from their son and brother when he was stationed in the Navy, conversations they had during his leaves. Um, Seaman Clyde Williams had one leave of absence during his naval career uh, after he was accepted into the School of Music and, and before he would be uh, assigned a date for boot camp, he had a nine-day leave. Well, nine days was really not enough time for him to get back to Oklahoma. It would have taken him three days each way by train, didn't have the money. They, they all agreed, the family agreed, that it wasn't worth it. Um, to, for him to go home during that leave. But the family did visit him on the occasion of his graduation from the Naval School, School of Music in May. So they were able to see their, and meet with their son um, at that time. And actually, he did get a two-week leave uh, after boot camp and before he began his course of study. So he did spend uh, Christmas, a, a, a period of about 10 days after Christmas, with his family. So they had a couple of opportunities to, to see him before he left uh, and was stationed on the Arizona. Um, they were also able to meet a lot of the fellow bandsmen that were in uh, Clyde's band uh, at their graduation. And so they were the only family. Uh, the parents and the sister uh, actually drove. And it, you know, these days you think, well, if I was going to go to Washington, well, I'd buy an airline ticket and I'd jump on the plane and I'd be there in three hours. Well, that wasn't the way it is in 1940. Uh, it was a big undertaking. They had to have a car that would get them there. It was a long journey for them, so it really was uh, uh, something that they were able to visit uh, him on the occasion of his uh, graduation, and they were the only families, really, uh, to meet the other bandsmen. Some of the bandsmen lived in the east, and so they were visited by their family on occasion, or if they were close enough, they could go visit their family in New York or, P or Pennsylvania. And sometimes, um, while they were in training, uh, the bandsmen would invite their friends. Some of their friends would go and visit them, so they did have some um, interaction with some of the band parents. But for the most part, none of the families of the bandsmen really knew or met each other ever. Um, uh, Molly had uh, letters and photos that she was able to uh, get access to that were shared among the surviving families after the, after the attack. Um, she had interviews with Pearl Harbor, Harbor survivors um, and information from band members from, who were serving on other ships 
at the time of Pearl Harbor, she uh, tried to um, make as many contacts of that sort as, as possible. She didn't write this book until the 90s. So she was at age 70 or 75 is when she wrote the book. Um, Now, Molly and her mother, Clyde's mother, and um, Molly's daughter, Peggy, actually were able to visit Hawaii and, and visit the Arizona Memorial uh, in the late 80s. So they made a trip there. And, um, and what uh, she reported in the book was that, of course, they were sitting in the, the, the room where they were viewing the movie about what happened at Pearl Harbor. And, all of a sudden flashed a picture of the band. And I'll show you that picture in just a moment. Um, but they, um, that was such a surprise that they actually saw this picture uh, of their son uh, as part of the band. And uh, the other thing that she reports in her book was that there were a lot of stories uh, after the Pearl Harbor attack about, you know, were we asleep at the switch? What, why did this happen? And so on. And apparently there were stories uh, that, that were told, I guess you'd call them conspiracy theories now. Oh, oh, your son was in that band. Well, I guess I heard that they were all asleep in bed that morning and that's, you know, that, that's, they died in their beds or something like that. She knew that that was not the case. She knew that that was not the case. So in addition to uh, helping write this book to remember these musicians, uh, she also wanted to right these wrong or clear up these misconceptions about uh, what their activities were on board the ship. So uh, I found the book to really be a, a, a tremendous, an excellent read. Now, um, and of course, I bought this book in 2018. Now, fast forward a little bit. Uh, in 2019, 2020, 2020, um, now we're coming up to the 80th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack. That would have been last year, 2021. And uh, I had the idea, uh, and one of the things that, that is in the book is they had programs of musical concerts that, they, that the band played in Honolulu. There were two different concert programs, so they knew what music was being played. And I thought, well, maybe this would be a good idea to recreate that, con that one of those concerts. So, of course, I have lots of music contacts in Milwaukee, and I've talked to a number of them, including Dr. Patricia Backus of Waukesha. And Pat is, I've known her for 40 years, and she's a trumpet player and a conductor and a band historian. And she liked the idea, and she actually had a band. She had knew enough people that she felt could volunteer their services to prepare a program of this music. So that's what we did. Uh, and uh, I thought that this might be worthy of some publicity, local. We didn't get any newspaper coverage, but uh, I knew uh, the general manager from years back. I knew the general manager of uh, Radio 620, uh, uh, the, the local station in, in Milwaukee. And I contacted him and he said, I like that idea. And so he transferred uh, my inquiry over to the news division, the radio news division. I was kind of hoping for some television coverage also. And in visions of grandeur, I also thought, well, maybe this is something the Today Show would be interested in. Well, we never got that far. But um, Pat was given the oppor opportunity to uh, uh, be interviewed by the, the weekend radio gal, the news gal on uh, Radio 620. So. Uh, we, uh, so that gave us a lot of publicity. And so we had 100 people in attendance at the concert, and we performed that concert in Milwaukee on December 7th of 2021, so on the day of the 80th anniversary. I've got a link to that concert, and if anybody is interested in that, uh, I've got a sheet of paper that gives my name and phone number and the link to that concert, and also the name of this book. I'll tell you a bit more about uh, how, uh, how accessible copies of the book are. Um, and uh, you can access that link to the concert. I'll be the one sitting on the right playing the French horn, and next to me are two high school students who are my private students at the time. Now, a disclaimer about that, it's, we, are, we were volunteer musicians, and we had three rehearsals. So I think the quality of the music that you will hear maybe isn't what you would have expected for the Arizona band, who that was their full-time jobs. Okay, so just a grain of salt about that. But if you were to find that program in the book. It's the exact same program as listed um, in uh, the book as one of the concerts that were performed in Honolulu, except for one piece that we couldn't find the music for. 
and it occurred to me then that a lot of the music they played, of course they had written music and, and uh, music that the band had in their, in, the, in their music library, but a lot of the music they played in concert were things that the band members wrote or they were original manuscripts. Well, anything like that, that 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 they had on the Arizona, well, that was lost also. Anyway, but I thought that uh, when we did this concert, I wanted to do the narration and have the program notes, and I thought it would be a good idea to maybe see if I could contact this lady who was the author. Now, she would have been about 100 years old, so I, it didn't occur to me, I mean, it did occur to me that she might not even be living anymore. So what I did is I, and how would you contact them? I Googled the book, and it said um, who the publisher was. It was called Silent Song Publishing. And she says in the book, Molly, says that she actually self-published the book. I don't know anything about publishing, but to me, self-publishing a book sounds like a tremendous undertaking and an expensive thing. And so um, there was really no phone number. Uh, so I just wrote a letter uh, to the Silent Song Publishing Company at the address listed in the book. And in the letter, that's how I address the envelope, and in the, uh, in the content of my letter, I just said, I'm trying to reach out to any uh, the author or any of the family who might be interested in knowing that we're planning to do this anniversary concert. And I provided, of course, my address and my email. Well, sure enough, I got an email from Peggy Kent, the author's daughter. She had just passed away. And, uh, but she liked the idea. And actually, she was a member of a Naval Musicians Facebook group. And that was, I found that very interesting. So she uh, knew about the concert. She heartily endorsed us doing it. She liked the idea. And one of the reasons that the book was written is to, so that these musicians wouldn't be forgotten. You know? um, so she was very happy and uh, she put on the Facebook page that this was happening and she got a lot of interest. So I think there were a lot of people around the country that listened to our concert. Um, Now, some information, uh, now let's get to the information that Molly shares in the book that she wrote about the band. Now, we can go to the first slide, which is the, the Arizona. The Arizona was launched June 19, 1915, and commissioned on October 17, 1916. So it had a, a life of 25 years before it was destroyed in, in the Pearl Harbor attack. 1,177 sailors and Marines who were on the ship lost their lives that day. Of that number, 1,102 of the sailors and Marines on board the ship, the remains were never recovered, and they're considered uh, interred at sea on their ship. About 65 remains were recovered from the waters of Pearl Harbor. So, uh, and uh, there were 2,403 uh, military personnel lost on December 7th, in addition to that, um, civilian casualties. So the, uh, the number of uh, deaths on that day represented by Arizona crew was a little under half. She still lies at her moorings and was never decommissioned. Now, later I'm going to show you a picture of the Arizona Memorial in your aerial view that you can look and you can actually see the ship in, in the harbor. And what you'll notice, there is one gun turret that is still visible, almost cutting through the surface of the water. And now again, another thing that I'm not an expert on is the Arizona and where, where they were and, and, and everything. You know, okay. Although I've, in just in kind of Googling a little bit around it, I think I have found a new interest because, of course, divers have explored the, the wreckage and, and they've mapped it. It's like the Titanic, you know, they're mapping these things. And so I think the turret that you'll see is probably this one because it's, it's higher in the ship. So that would make sense that if the ship sunk, you know, uh, that this turret would remain. A lot of the superstructure was missing, uh, is missing because it was removed. Um, so how is it these 21 musicians ended up on this ship? All of these bandsmen had been... Uh, studying band lessons uh, in grade school and in high school. They were all top players in their high school bands and orchestras. Um, many of them aspired to be professional musicians, and so many of them dreamed of playing with name bands, Tommy Dorsey, Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller. Um, and, of course, uh, 
at that time in high school, a lot of these musicians were deciding what they were going to do with their lives. They had an interest in music, and it made sense for them to pursue it as a career. But the, the likelihood of funds being available for them to study in a conservatory or go to a college. Now, it might be different if you lived in Chicago or New York, where you'd, maybe you would be studying privately with members of the or symphony orchestra, or you would make contacts that way. Maybe you'd live at home and, and pursue your, your study uh, that way. But most of these bands were from rural areas, and the prospect for them being able to afford going to a college or a university or conservatory was zero. So it all made sense for them to consider joining the service um, in order to, you know, to attempt a music career. Um, so uh, one by one, they all applied for, and of course they could choose between the Marines or the Army, but I think many of them made the decision that the Navy would have the, the, the best chance of them uh, it, it's being successful in, in becoming professional musicians. There were lots of Navy bands, and all the big uh, uh, battleships and destroyers all had resident field bands. No, that, and of course that's in addition to the bands who would be on Army or Naval bases. And of course you've got the big Marine band, the official ceremonial band for the Army and the Marines and the, and the, and the Navy. So that's what they aspire to. So anyway, they had to first enlist in the Navy. So here were the requirements just for enlisting in the Navy, not the music school, but for the Navy. They had to be uh, native-born or, or naturalized U.S. citizens. They would be not less than 18 years, uh, nor 25 or over. So they had to be between 18 and 24 years of age. They had to be of good character, and to prove that, they would have recommendations from their teachers or band directors or high school principals. Um, they could be not less than 63 inches in height. Of course, no women, right? This was an, an all-male thing in, in the military at that time, <coughs> uh, at least for the music schools. Um, high school graduate or equivalent education. They sh must be unmarried or remain so during their uh, time in the music school. Now, there were, uh, when, the, when the band got to the Arizona, there were two married men. One was the director, uh, the, the band leader, and of course he was a naval veteran and had played himself in Navy bands. So his aspiration now was to go back to the Naval School of Music and study conducting and become a conductor and have his own band stationed on one of the battleships. Um, and then another member of the band uh, had a girl and they decided they would get married after the training was completed and before he shipped out. So there were two married men, but, the, and, um, but they, of course, their wives didn't join them in Honolulu. And um, all uh, men stationed on ships in Pearl Harbor would reside on their ships. If, you had, if your wife was with you, you could reside on the mainland, but most of the crew of these ships all resided on, on the ship. Um, and I don't think there were too many rank and file uh, Navy guys who would, brought their, who would have brought their wives to Hawaii. It was just too expensive. So uh, those who did, were married, had their families there, were older uh, fellows and probably were, uh, were of higher rank than, than uh, these musicians would be. Um, they had to commit to an enlistment period of six years. So the plan would be that they would get acceptance to the, music, the Naval School of Music and study for two years. It was almost like a college course. And it wasn't just for, you know, you couldn't just say, I play the trumpet, so I'll join the Navy band. So again, these were really already top performers. Um, and then they would be assigned to a, a unit, a, a naval band, and then serve for four more years. They had to pass a, a rigid physical exam. And they also had to be height and weight proportionate. So what Seaman uh, Clyde Williams ran into was he went for his physical he checked out at everything but his weight. He wasn't too heavy, he was too thin. So they rejected him. So he had uh, hitchhiked from his little town in Oklahoma to Dallas to take his physical. So he came, so he had to hitchhike back and all dejected and everything. This has nothing to do with musical requirements. Um, but anyway, so his dad uh, worked through the local congressman and they somehow wrote a letter or asked if there was, if he could correct this weight deficiency, could he reapply? And uh, they received a reply from um, the, ad, the rear admiral in charge of 
personnel matters for the Navy, and that was Admiral Nimitz. So, of course, he rose in the ranks later, and he's a well-known name, but at that time, he was uh, the person that apparently said, sure, he can reapply again. We'd be happy to have him. Okay? So he's tried to bulk up, and even uh, when he went for his second physical, he was a little bit under. So I think the doctor said, well, you're pretty close, so just go away and eat some bananas and all the milk you can drink, and then come back and we'll weigh you again. And this time he was accepted. Uh, they had to uh, furnish proof of their age, and if they were under 21, they had to have a written consent of a parent or guardian. They could have no police record except for minor infractions not involving moral turpitude. And they could have no juvenile record, never been in reform school, or they could not have a prison record. Okay. So those are the things they needed to tick off just to be considered you know, for enlistment into the Navy. Then came the musical background requirements. Once they passed the physical, now uh, they, were, they could now be considered for um, membership or enrollment in the school, and they went by a month. So I think that Seaman Williams, um, because of this delay in getting his physical you know, thing organized, um, ended up being uh, uh, accepted into, I think, the November class. So this is now November 1940. He had graduated from high school in May, and now it's uh, November of 1940, he was accepted. So they would, he had to make his way uh, at his own expense to Washington, D.C., to the Naval School of Music, and play an audition. Now, this was probably the most important audition they ever played in their lives. And uh, I'm sure that when they went into the room, they didn't see a smiling face, right? This was probably an upper-level uh, uh, teacher or na high-ranking naval musician. And so I'm sure what would happen is he walked in the room, and the man would say, sit and he put some music in front of them. Play. So they had to play the music. So what were they judged on? First of all, sight reading. Uh, if you couldn't sight read what was put in front of you, you automatically would, would not pass. So um, they all, and again, these were all top players in their high school bands. They were all good musicians. So these uh, 20 passed their sight reading audition. They were judged on technique. They had to know their major and minor scales, arpeggios. And um, they should, uh, and then technique, uh, they w had to have the capability of playing difficult music with very few mistakes, preferably none. Um, tone quality, they had to sound right, uh, and they had to have a sound that would blend with other uh, instruments in the band. Articulation, rhythm, they had to know how to count. And I've known a lot of musicians that they, they can doodle on their instruments, but they can't look at a piece of music and play it in rhythm. That's kind of important. Um, in fact, the kids that I teach French horn to, they now, I teach a lot of junior high kids now, and I say, well, what do you do in band class? Because these kids cannot play. I mean, I don't understand what happens in band class, and I think what happens is they're just happy if they all start together and end together. <laughs> so rhythm was very important. And again, musical phrasing. They had to exhibit that they could play music with expression or dynamics, that sort of thing. Once they were accepted, then they were assigned a date for boot camp. And as I mentioned, Seaman Williams had about a nine-day lag in there between his acceptance and when he would be scheduled for the next boot camp slot. So again, he decided not to uh, try to go home to Oklahoma. Um, now one, uh, of course, at boot camp, they were just with any other naval recruits. So they were thrown in. They weren't just all musicians. They were every, every uh, naval recruit would go to the same boot camp. Um, and of course, the musicians were a, one step ahead of the other recruits. They all knew how to march because they all were in marching band. Okay, so they were kind of one step ahead of the of the group that way. Um, and attendance, you know, and getting accepted into the naval school of music or any military school of music made perfect sense for them. They didn't pay tuition or pay room and board. They had paid training. They got room and board during this two-year course of study. They had guaranteed employment, and once they passed their, their two-year training, they'd be assigned to a naval band. They were guaranteed employment for four more years. They would enter the, uh, the Navy uh, at the rank of apprentice seaman. That's when they started. Their pay was $21 a month. After four months, they would move up to seaman second class, and their pay was 
then went up to $36. Um, and of course, all the members of the, the Arizona's band, they were all applied and got accepted at different times. They didn't all come into the same class. So some of them started applying and they probably had their basic training were already at the music school, maybe in, earlier in the fall. And then others were still being accepted and in getting into the music school uh, even in January and February. Okay? So as the band progressed through the months, you know, it was always a big deal when one of the seamen would pass that milestone and get his pay raised by um, $15. After 10 months of service, they'd move up to musician second class at $54 a month. So some of them had achieved that by the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, but not all of them. Um, and Molly makes the note, uh, the mention in, in, the, in the book that um, every letter the families all received from their sons, the subject of money always came up. They, then, they never had enough, they could barely get by. Of course, they had what they needed, but if they wanted anything, you know, if they wanted to go on leave and spend any money, they just didn't have it. Um, and and it, it seems as if the pay scale for these musicians was lower than the pay scale for other enlistees in the Navy. Um, they had to purchase their own uniforms, and they had, of course, they had their own instruments, and the Navy didn't provide instruments, and um, they needed all the music that they would use in their private lessons had to be provided by them. So a lot of them brought music with them, and once they were accepted in the School of Music, they had their families ship any music or any supplies that they would need. Um, and Molly made the comment, too, that um, in the Navy, a sailor that was assigned to swab the deck didn't have to provide his own mop. But the musicians had to provide their own. <laughs> they had to provide everything. Okay. The other thing is that the band directors, of course, all wanted their musicians to be the best. You know, they wanted them to be the best band because their rating and their assignment was going to be uh, dependent on how well they did in organizing and conducting their bands. So in uh, Seaman Williams' band, they, the band director required that he wanted them to all buy new instruments. So they didn't want any second-hand instruments that they brought from home. So they all, many of them bought new instruments. And of course, they didn't have the money for that, so they took out loans for those instruments. So they were paying, in addition, out of their $21 or whatever, they were paying a, a small monthly fee to rent their instruments. I guess a lot of those loans didn't get paid off. And of course, all the instruments were lost in the attack also. Now, the two years of training, which they thought they were going to get, didn't happen. Now, the build-up to impending war required the Navy to turn out bands that would serve on the ships uh, at a faster pace. So what was uh, to become Band 22 when they graduated? That was the 22nd band to be uh, to go through the music school and to be assigned to a ship, um, graduated in May of 1941, and they found out that they would be assigned to the Arizona. So, so the Arizona band, their training at the Naval School of Music may be ranged from four to six to eight months, and then they served on the ship for about six months. So that was their, the length of their naval career. So, in 1940, all the members of the band were making their applications, passing their physicals, took their basic training into the new year of 1941. Now, at the music school, they took lessons on their primary instruments. These were uh, experienced you know, band teachers. They were probably maybe players in uh, the Navy band, the official president's Navy band in Washington. And they all played in a massed band. So all the students played in one great, great big band. And as new students came and others graduated, the, the membership in this band changed. And every, uh, every so often, they would have auditions. And so the, the musicians that, they, that, were, uh, that uh, the, the, the leaders felt were ready to be assigned and be autonomous in, in part of a, a smaller band would be assigned to their 20-piece band. Um, Fred Kinney was the leader of Band 22. He was a baritone player on, on, in naval bands, and he had been in the Navy for 15 years. So uh, in addition to their private lessons and uh, playing in this mass band and eventually playing also then in, in a 20-piece band, uh, they had a required amount of time they had to spend practicing on their own, and I'm sure it was hard to get a practice room. Um, 
they all took lessons and also on secondary instruments. So they, they weren't just specialists on one instrument. So they all had to have a secondary instrument that they also studied. Many of them already played other instruments anyway. All the saxophone players also played clarinet. They played all the woodwind instruments. Um, the t very often the tuba player would also know how to play the string bass. And that came in handy because you'd play tuba in the concert band and then you'd play string bass in the jazz band. Um, and a lot of them played piano, a lot of them were singers, um, and a lot of them played guitar and accordion. So they were a versatile uh, group of people. And of course, in the Navy band setting, they could be called on to play any sorts of music. Uh, and, and very often they were called upon to play for private receptions, small groups, combos would play. So they had to be versatile, and that was uh, one of the bases for them being judged and ready to, to be assigned to a band. Now, at the Naval School of Music, in addition, they had other duties. They all participated and rotated in security, uh, security watches, you know. Um, they had to maintain their living quarters. And they also marched in parades when asked uh, to do so. And that included the 1941 inaugural for President Roosevelt in March uh, when they were in the school. And they did anything else they were ordered to do. Now, once the 20-piece bands began to be formed, that doesn't mean you stuck with that group. So the band directors did a lot of wheeling and dealing. So if you felt that your band needed a better trumpet player, you might talk to one of the other leads and say, I need a better trumpet player than what I've got, so I'll trade you this something that you need. So it's kind of like the NFL draft, I think. Um, each leader wanted their band to be the best in the fleet. So there was constant switching of personnel. And another thing that would happen if, if one of the naval ships all of a sudden had a an opening for a, a musician, well, where did they replace that musician from? Well, they would go to the Naval School of Music. And so if, the, if a ship uh, that was ready to sail next week uh, needed a baritone horn player, well, they would look to see who they had at the Naval School of Music, and they would pick one. Sometimes it was voluntary. If no one volunteered, then they would assign somebody. That's, they did what they were told. And um, so when Molly kind of makes a comment in the book about this is that how fate determined that these 20 would be on the Arizona. And I'm sure there were situations where, um, in fact, I know that sometimes, you know, of course, the students at the school would form friendships with other students. None of them knew each other, but they formed bonds with other students. And so sometimes, and I know that she reported that her brother had uh, formed a friendship with a, with a guy, and he, they wanted to ship out together and be assigned on the same ship. Well, that didn't happen. If it had, his life would have been spared, but then somebody else would have been slotted in his slot. And so fate really had a lot to, to do with um, who would live and who would die. Um, you know, just a, um, a word about military bands in general. You know, when we think of military bands, or when we think of the Marine Band, you know, the president's own Marine Band, a big deal. You, you see them at perform at inaugurations, or they're at uh, Christmas events, or it was the 4th of July, and that, uh, that Navy band or that Marine band were really like professional organizations. They, they were less military as, as they were professional musical organizations. Um, now, in the, in the 30s and 40s, um, of course, all those musicians came from uh, people who applied and got accepted and went through the ranks. Now, uh, these days, though, the Marine band, is, for an example, that is really a professional organization. So you don't join, enlist in the Marines and hope to work your way up through the ranks and then become a member if you're really good in the Marine Band. They have, they have open auditions. They announce audition openings for a spot in the Marine Band. And those are often in the musician's paper. And I've been a member of the musician's unit for 40 years. So we'd, every month I'd get the paper. And in addition to a symphony orchestra that needed a tuba player or they needed a first violin or they needed a harp, well, you would see regularly openings in the Navy band or the Marine band. The, the, the Marine band needs a French horn or the Navy band needs an oboe, something like that. So professional musicians would apply for these jobs. And if they were awarded the job, then it, now they were required to join that area of the service. Now, they probably had Boot camp also, but I don't think the boot camp for somebody that was going to play in the Marine Band was probably the same kind of boot camp that the recruits would, 
would be going through. Anyway, so that's how that worked. And in fact, uh, when I was in college, they had an opening for fourth horn in the Milwaukee Symphony. That's when I was in college. I auditioned for that job. I didn't get it. <laughs> but the, the guy who did get that spot actually came from the top US Marine Band. I thought that was interesting. If you were in the Marine Band, why would you want to play in a symphony orchestra? But, well, in a symphony, in the, in a military, in the Marine Band, you're still in the Marines, and you do what you're told, and that's probably there are some things that kind of constrain your ability to, to you know, your schedule was not your own. And uh, so it made sense for me that somebody from the Marine Band would now be looking for other professional opportunities. And of course, if you get into a symphony orchestra and you can maintain your uh, playing ability, that's really your job for, could be your job for life. Anyway, so that was interesting. Um, now, some instruments were more in demand than others. So they couldn't take 200 trumpet players and no French horns or whatever. So if you, um, there was a high demand for tubas, flutes, and French horns. That last one caught my attention. So they would uh, sometimes be willing to break the rules for, to make sure that those instruments, that they had players for those instruments. And actually the youngest member of the Arizona's band was a tuba player, and he was 16 at the time of his enlistment and 17 at the time of the attack. So exceptions were made. And the ages of the, the Arizona musicians probably range from 16, 17 up to about 24, 25. Now, naval bands or military bands fall into three categories. First is ceremonial. And see, the Marine Band, the Navy Band in Washington, they would be more like ceremonial bands. You know, they give concerts, they special events, that sort of thing. And so uh, as just like uh, that on, on a naval battleship or a destroyer, uh, one of the functions of the band was ceremonial. They, had, they were assigned to play for colors. They would get in full uniform and play for colors every morning at 8 a.m. Every morning that they served on the Arizona, except when the ship was at sea. Uh, they prob I, I don't think the US flag was raised uh, like they would when the ship was in port. But every morning at 8 a.m., uh, the band would have to play for uh, the raising of colors, raising the U.S. flag over the vessel. And they also performed for other ceremonies, private receptions, uh, visiting dignitaries. And so that was their first one, one function. The other was uh, that they were really there to help promote ship morale. Okay? You know, there was no television, and I don't think there were, the boys didn't have radios. What would they do to pass their time? And you have to have something that would help fill the time or help occupy them. Uh, so the, uh, the ship bands would perform a noontime concert when the ship was in port, would perform a, a, a noontime concert every day, okay? Plus other times. There were times when uh, the band, when stationed in uh, Honolulu, would also play concerts uh, at, at, uh, on land, you know, at, at hotels or, or other things. That didn't happen very often. Um, but that was their uh, ship, you know, to promote ship morale. So, um, and I guess just another comment is that, you know, up until the 30s, military bands were kind of stuffy affairs. Um, they were old school, I guess, and, and the music that they would play would be well, like classic marches, uh, pieces written for band, uh, transcriptions of music written for symphony orchestras were transcribed to be played by bands. I guess we call it long hair music. These young sailors would call that boring music. So now, uh, Mar, we, we go to the next shot, which is, I think, the band pick. Okay, so this is a picture of the Arizona band. It's really the only formal picture. There are candid photos, you know, of, of certain musicians and everything, but this is really the only official t picture uh, taken of this band, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But um, so, um, so the bands were very popular because they were playing music that that the boys could relate to. Okay, so all the uh, when the outgoing band of the Arizona, which were older guys, and that's the kind of music they played—the old school, the long hair, kind of boring. Um, 
they were thrilled when uh, they now got the chance to hear new music of the type that they were, uh, were familiar with. And, um, and of course, that was music that would remind them of home and girls, you know, that were left behind. Um, and the Arizona band was especially loved by their commander, Captain Van Falkenberg, and Rear Admiral Isaac Kidd. They, they loved their band. <clears throat> Admiral Kidd's wife had stayed stateside, so he, again, he was a, uh, a married sailor, but his wife wasn't there, so he actually resided on the Arizona. I think his corridors were a little bit different than what the, <laughs> the, the, the normal seamen. Um, so the third area of service for the for bandsmen were what they would be assigned to do during times of battle. Okay, so they also had to learn uh, to administer first aid. They would assist in sick bay, administer morphine shots, and their battle station for in all I think all the bands on battleships, uh, their uh, battle station was to run to the uh, ammunition holds below the gun turrets, and their job was to take the bags of gunpowder, place it on these lifts that would take it up to the guns above. That's what they would have been doing at the time after the attack began. That's what they would have done is run to that battle station. That's the duty they would be performing at that time. So as I said, the band completed their training and graduated in May of 1941. And um, the Arizona was uh, based in its home port of San Diego. Now, they didn't go by train. Uh, they, the Navy had a different mo mode of transportation available to them. They went by ship. The USS Lassen was scheduled to leave Washington, whatever, and make their way toward San Diego through the canal. So the band was actually assigned to uh, be a, a ship's band for that band. The Lassen was an ammunition carrier. So their whole cargo was ammunition that was going to be going to the battleships. So they were basically on a floating bomb. Um, so they got their first life, uh, taste of life on a naval vessel by uh, sailing on the Lassen around Cuba, through the canal, up the coast of Mexico. And uh, one tricky thing was that uh, Molly reports that her brother uh, was a sleepwalker. So that's not a very good thing to have if you're on a boat. And in the hot weather that they encountered on the Lassen, it was so hot that many of them uh, slept on, on the deck. So, but all his uh, shipmates knew, the band, fellow band members knew that he had this issue. And so they were particularly uh, you know, watching out for him and, and they tried to corral him and put him back. Um, anyway, so that's good, he didn't fall off ship. Um, they transferred to the, uh, from the Lassen to the Arizona on June 17, 1941, and they played their first concert for the crew that very day at noon. Now, um, of course, the whereabouts and plans for naval vessels was secret. You know, they, they weren't allowed to tell what their plans were. And so when the ship sailed later that month, uh, they didn't know where they were going, but they could tell that they were sailing southwest. And so they, it kind of became apparent that they were heading for Honolulu and to the naval base at Pearl Harbor. Now, life uh, for a naval fuel band on a battleship tr centered around two rooms. One was the living quarters where they slept and ate, and the other was the band rehearsal room where they rehearsed and practiced and where the instruments and music were stored. Their living quarters consisted of tables and hammocks. These were all hung from the ceilings on hooks. So never, they were never on the floor at the same time. So in the morning, the hammocks were raised up and the tables came down. And this wasn't at eight o'clock in the morning. You know, this was early. At night, the tables went up and the hammocks came down. So that's how the families knew. They weren't in bed sleeping in bed at the time of the attack. They didn't even sleep in beds. They had hammocks. And they knew that they would have had to been up early, as usual, because they couldn't oversleep. The hammocks had to come up and the tables came down. They would get ready to play for colors. That's how they knew, the families knew, what their, at least what their morning would have been like on the morning of the attack. They never had a day off. Now, in the fall of 1941, um, the Navy or the military people in Pearl Harbor organized something called the Battle of the Bands. And this was a competition. It was meant to be a competition. The idea was, let's choose the best band 
of all the naval bands, uh, and they competed not only against other bands from uh, other ships, battleships and destroyers, but also bands from the Army, the Marine, and the submarine bases. So at each contest, uh, there would be four bands that would play their, 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 make their presentations. And two of the bands that played would win that competition. They'd move on to the semifinals. The winners were uh, determined by audience applause. And so it wasn't very scientific. The winners were going to be the ones who had the biggest contingent of their comrades or their shipmates at, at, uh, at the event. So the Arizona band advanced to the semifinals, and that was scheduled for number November 22nd. That's when this picture was taken. Okay. So again, this is the only official photo of the band. There are other candid shots and everything. Now, I also want to tell you a little bit about the, the band setup. Now, this is the swing band. This is the jazz band, the stage band. Now, we would call it jazz ensemble. If your kids are in high school and they're in a jazz group, they would call it the jazz ensemble. They called it the swing band, the stage band, the jazz band. Okay. And the first row was saxophones. It's kind of hard to tell, but the next row behind that were trombones. Behind them was the trumpets. Behind them, the drummers and the string bass player, who was also a tuba player. So, as I mentioned before, all those saxophone players also played clarinet. Now, this is not 20 musicians, because not all the members of the band played instruments that would be used in the swing band. So if you played the baritone horn, you weren't in it. If you played the French horn, you weren't in it. Um, they had two tuba players. Well, one of the tuba players, the young man, uh, didn't play in this. So um, anyway, that would be the setup for swing band. Now, for the concert band, that would involve all the players. I suppose the ones not involved in swing band when they were rehearsing those pieces probably did maintenance or cleaned up their corridors or whatever. They had other things that they would be assigned to do. But um, anyway, for the concert band, you know, you've seen pictures of bands who are going to concert. They, the musicians sit in sort of a semicircle around the conductor. So that's how they would have been set up for that. And um, this fellow here was actually the flute player in the band. So he was in high demand. And the other saxophones plus three other musicians, they were all clarinet players. So in the concert band, they played clarinet. So that's when they were playing long hair music, you know. But these musicians were all excellent at all that type of music. They were, and they really were considered probably the best band in the fleet. Um, that's their director here. And um, so you can tell that this was the Battle of the Bands. You've got spectators in the back. The last semifinal concert was held on December 6th. Of course, the Arizona band played their semifinal on the 22nd of November. So on December 6th, the night before the attack, there was another semifinal. The, final, the last semifinal would have been held. So the musicians in this group didn't play that night, but most of them probably went to the concert. They wanted to check out the competition. And of course, they, all the Navy band musicians knew each other. So the ones they went to listen to on December 6th, they were their classmates. They all knew each other, so it gave them a chance to uh, to meet each other. And again, um, if you knew musicians on other battleships, that doesn't mean you could see them anytime you want. There was no telephones. You know, we didn't have you know cell phones, or you know, you couldn't call up your buddy and say, "Hey, let's get together." Somebody you knew from another ship. So they would have to just chance it. So whenever an event like this happened, they knew that they were going to see their their former classmates and friends they had made. So then they were all there that night. And that's how we know um, uh, that they, a story that they had played so well the night before that the band director gave them the next morning off. That just wasn't true. Okay. The band never got to play for colors on December 7th. So the attack on December 7th began just before 8 o'clock. So the band would have been assembled on the deck in uniform, ready to play for colors. Um, and the, from survivors or people who witnessed the attack, um, there, was, there must have been a signal you know, for when, when 8 o'clock would come. But I guess one of the bands had actually started their playing of color, music for colors, playing a march and marching along to where the colors would be uh, done. Uh, and, but, but the Arizona band was 
observed to be in formation. They hadn't started playing yet. Now that band was playing when the attack began. Apparently the unwritten rule was if you're playing the, the national anthem, you don't stop. So um, I, m I imagine that they continued and finished their piece before they went to their battle stations. So when the attack began, battle stations, so their job would have been run to run to their battle station, which was below turret number two, where they were to do this job of handing the ammunition. Now I thought about that, and um, of course, they had battle station drills on many occasions, probably mostly when the ship was at sea. And so I'm sure they didn't announce, okay, we're having battle station drill at two o'clock, so they'd be ready. They never knew what was going to happen. But I would doubt that they had a drill at any time, never in port, and of course, this is where the attack happened. And um, if they had battle station drill when the ship was at sea, they wouldn't necessarily, no, they might be practicing in the band room while battle stations were sounded. They'd set the instruments down and they'd run. Here, they were in full uniform, un totally unexpecting what would happen. So the, the chaotic you know, image I have of this is just running. Um, and so, of course, they had their instruments, and, and I understand that the bass drum was just thrown overboard because they didn't want that to get in the way of, of uh, you know, or to have it be an obstruction, you know, a, a barricade for people to get through. So now, Maureen, we can go to the next shot. So this is the exact moment that the, uh, the bomb, the, the deck penetrating bomb hit the Arizona and exploded the, the ammunition stores. And... Um, so this is the moment when, um, it's hard to believe that somebody captured that moment on, on, on a picture. I, it's just unbelievable to me that that would be the case. And we can go to the next shot then. So this was still short, very, probably for several days after the attack, this is what uh, the Arizona looked like. Now when the news of the, of the attack began to circulate in the States that Sunday afternoon and so on, there was very little information about casualties. No one knew who was affected. And of course, the Japanese were saying, well, we've sunk this ship, we've done this or that. But that could have been propaganda. The Navy wasn't really reporting anything. Uh, it, was just, it, it was just too early. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't have been able to do that. So the families waited and hoped for the best. But on December 10th now, the Navy released names of senior Navy, Navy personnel casualties. And Admiral Kidd's name was on that list. So the families now knew uh, that were aware that they had gotten letters from their son about Admiral Kidd loved their band. So if Admiral Kidd had perished, then they knew that they had to be prepared for the worst. The official notification started to be received by the families on December 20th. And um, Peggy Kent, the daughter of the author, and one of her emails said, yes, I never met my uncle Clyde, but my mother told me that after the attack and we knew that her uncle, who she had never met, had perished, um, her grandpa took the Christmas tree and threw it out in the garbage. Official notices to the family from the Department of the Navy didn't come until the spring. Since the finals of the Battle of the Bands was never held, the other three bands who would have competed all voted to, that the Arizona should be awarded the, the top prize. And it was thought by many that it was the best band in the fleet. Of the 21 musicians and band leader from band 22, the remains of 18 of them were never recovered, so they're interred on their ship. Unbelievably, three of the remains were recovered, and two of them are buried in Honolulu, and one was returned to their family for uh, interment in, in California. I have a couple of three theories about how these three bandsmen's remains were recovered. Um, and one is, okay, the force of this blast was so tremendous that if they were all at their battle station, gaps in the gaps would have been blown open and the ships, the side of the ships and their bodies would have been ejected. And that's how they were found in, found in, in the waters of Pearl Harbor. 
No one knows. But I have another theory, and that is that in the chaotic scene, I could understand that maybe there were people who were strafed by bullets and, and you know, fell into, the, into Pearl Harbor. Um, and I could also see where, again, they had these instruments that they were paying off. And no one, even at, during the attack, they couldn't envision that this was it. So we've got these instruments. We're paying every month on them. No one's going to pay them for me if it gets destroyed or whatever. So I could understand, here, you take my clarinet and drop it in the band room or whatever, something like that. So I could see that maybe um, some of them might have been delayed getting to their battle station. The, the, the explosion of the, you know, the bomb that hit the Arizona wasn't that long after the after the battle stations were, sound, were sounded. But the families took a lot of comfort in knowing that uh, when their sons died, that they were with their comrades, their friends, you know, that they weren't alone. As I said before, the Arizona musicians came from throughout some small towns throughout the United States. One bandsman had Wisconsin ties. Uh, clarinet and saxophone player Gerald Cox was a Wisconsin native, but his family moved to East Moline, Illinois when he was small. This is not mentioned in the book, but when we did our concert, we had the, the, the pastor guy that we enlisted you know, to do our narration that I wrote. Um, at the end of the program, we had a recitation of all the names, and Pat uh, Backus had acquired a, a, a bell, a ship's bell from the Yacht Club in Milwaukee. So at the end of the ceremony, it was more, um, more like a, 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 you know, a, a service, religious, not a religious service, but a, um, and we read, then this pastor read the names of all the members and then the bell would toll and after that was taps. When he got to that person's name, he said, and Gerald Cox from Wisconsin. I had no idea. I didn't know that. Uh, and if you Google his name, it, it doesn't say that. I'm not sure. I think it is true, but I don't know where he came across that. That was very interesting. Now, another part of the story now is how were the families able to contact each other after the attack? How is it that they found each other and they were able to exchange information and letters and pictures? Well, one of the band members had sent home, when they boarded the Arizona, in the ship's newsletter, they had a, an article about the band and it gave the names of the band members and their hometowns. And one of the band guys had sent that uh, newspaper, you know, that ship's newsletter, home to his family. So this mom thought, let's reach out and see if we can contact these, the, the families or next of kin to those folks. So she simply wrote a letter and she addressed each envelope to family or next of kin of naval Arizona seat musician so-and-so. And in the letter she um, said that she hoped that it would, this would reach uh, family members of this musician and that uh, if any of them could contact her, she felt that, uh, an ex you know, that um, hearing from other family members of, of, of the other musicians would be helpful for, for them all to understand who their friends were, who they were. The letters that they received from their sons never really mentioned individuals. They might say, the guys, or they said, this guy I went to this place with. So they didn't really get much information in the letters about the other musicians. Anyway, so she wrote these letters, not knowing what would come from that. And it's hard to believe in this day and age, but a lot of those, most of those letters reached those families. And of course, it makes sense in a way because many of them were from small towns. And of course, the boys' names would have been known to their local newspapers or, you know, in their families. The post office service, the post office would have known their names because they were local boys, some of the first to die in the war. So a lot of those letters did reach the families. So that's thus begun a decades long correspondence between all the families. And that was, again, a lot of the source material that Molly used for her, for her book. One band, band member had also had the foresight to send home his photo album. And so one family had pictures taken in Hawaii, not a lot, but uh, that 
and, and this particular bandsman was a photographer. That was his hobby. So he made it his job to kind of document and to take pictures. So a lot of the pictures that you find in this book are pictures that came from that photo album. There was never um, a meeting of all the families. There had been talk about meeting up or having a central location for families to come, but that, but that never happened. Now we can go to the next shot. So now here is the Pearl Harbor Memorial. And as I said before, when you go to the memorial, now, of course, it used to be you just go there and you'd, you'd sign in and they'd assign you a tour time. Well, now you have to do that all online. And they're very careful about limiting the numbers and everything. So you have to book in advance. And of course, you've got to be there early. Um, airport protocols, no, you know, no, bag, no, no bags. Everything has to be left in your car and everything. Anyway, so at your appointed time, then you see this movie again. And um, then you take the launch where you can visit and actually board the memorial from this end here. That's where the launch would, would stop. So the memorial uh, spans the, what remains of the ship, in, which lies in 40 feet of water at the bottom of the harbor, now the next one. So this is an aerial view. Okay. So you can see the launch and people, you know, the launch comes and the people on the launch get off and the next group comes and it's all very orderly and very solemn. You know, there's not a lot of laughing and, and whatever. And um, so you're able to view the ship. And so this is the, the gun tour that I mentioned to you before. That's probably the one that's visible. You know, it's, it actually lies partly above the water. And then the next, the final slide. Um, so at the far end from where you enter the memorial, this is the shrine room. And on the wall there is listed in alphabetical order all the, the names of um, those repairs. There were some Marines on board the ship. Those were over here. So to locate the band members' names, you'd have to know their names and find them alphabetically. But I, a couple of years ago, I had a lady that was going to Hawaii. And I said, well, if you go to the Pearl Harbor Museum, could you take a picture of this wall that lists all the, uh, the names? And she did, and she sent them to me. And so I could, was able to kind of blow them up. And for the most part, I found all the names that were listed in this book as, but as being in part of this naval band. Now, the final thing I wanted to talk about is just remembrances of Pearl Harbor. You know, it seemed to me that there was always information about it at the time, at the occasion of the anniversaries. Um, and of course, 2021 was a big year because of 80 years. And of course, that was the year of COVID. So any, um, any uh, remembrance ceremony they would have had last year probably was more limited and maybe, you know, but there's always, there are always survivors of, of Pearl Harbor coming for that. And, um, but I was, so this year, because I was getting ready for this talk, I thought, well, let's see what I can find. And I didn't see too much on the national news or in news reports. I think the most thing I saw was on the NBC Nightly News at the end of the, on Wednesday. At the very end, it showed this picture of the Arizona Memorial. But nothing was really spoken about it. I don't think there was anything on, there might have been something on the Today Show. But I thought that was kind of sad. And then um, I did pick up, I get the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel online, but I found an article yesterday. So I went and got a, a paper copy of it. So this is the paper. Oh. Well, anyway, it, it's, it's not on the title page, you know, on the head page. This is on page four. So I was kind of disappointed that it didn't get better better spot in the newspaper. But anyway, um, this article had an interview with a couple of the, of the vets. There's very few of them now. They're all in their hundreds. You know, it, it won't be long when all of them will be gone. But they interviewed uh, a sailor named Ira Schaub, age one and two. He was on the U.S. Dobbin, and he was a tuba player. And he says he remembers the Dobbin was not that far away from the Arizona and I think he uh, said that he had, um, you know, anyway, he told of his experience, which is certainly different than uh, 
uh, the boys on the Arizona experience. Anyway, so that's my presentation. Any questions? Can you go, go back three slides where it's got right there? Look in the lower left. That's the big gun. Oh. That, that's that's yeah. the one that's above. That's okay. the one. And they, they would have been uh, carrying powder right there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, so it's likely that they were below that deck there. Yeah, wow. interesting. Yeah. Could you go back to the picture of the band, too? I just wanted to mention one thing that I forgot to say before. Anyway, so picture yourself in, in the, the movie theater. Now you're the mother of one of these musicians, or the sister, or the niece, and you'd never met your uncle. And here he is, staring back at them. <laughs> 50 years hence. In very interesting. Did all the um, Navy ships have bands? Uh, the, the larger ships. So if, if it was a battleship or a destroyer, okay. then they had bands. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Do they still? I would say yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then let's go to the last slide. Anyway, this is the book. This is what started all this, for me, anyway. And I've reread and reread the thing, and I always pick up a few interesting things that I hadn't noticed before. Now, you might think, well, gee, I'd like to get a copy of that book. It's not easy. Again, it was self-published. And when I first contacted um, the family a year ago, I thought, well, we're having this concert. And even some of the volunteers and musicians might want copies of the book. It occurred to me. I'm not a, you know, a, an agent for selling this book. And this is obviously not a for-profit thing for, for the family to, to produce this book. But um, anyway, when I contacted Peggy Kant, she said, well, I've got, I've got about 30 books. But she had just gotten a big order from the, the, the Memorial Bookstore. And so she, when they order books, then she likes to provide them. But she said at the time about a year ago that they were debating whether to place another order. Because again, I imagine that probably, I don't know how much to order a couple of cases to make it realistic to be able to order it. You'd have to order quite a few. And she, they sell it retail for $25 if you were to write to the publisher. But now you can't even write to them because you just told me three days ago that that address isn't any good anymore. And I didn't ask her for the address. I will now because I, I might want to order a couple for myself. So you'd have to go to Honolulu to the, the bookstore or the memorial in order to find the book. And she's, that's right. And she's debating now whether to order. And of course her mother's passed away and now she feels like this is her thing now. I guess it's on my shoulders now to carry this forward. And I think the purpose of the book really was that she didn't want these musicians and her son specifically to be forgotten. So that's, uh, that was touching to me, and that's why I found it very interesting. That's why we did the concert we did, and that's why I wanted to bring this pro program to you. So. so did you say the band members were paid less, their pay scale was less than the other? That's what she reports in the book. She said that normal naval recruits, and of course she made the comment, yeah, sure, the, the people in the arts and people in music were expected to do all this stuff for for less than other people were getting. I don't know. Um, then she also made the comment, though, of course, when there's budget cuts, usually the arts you know, go first. And so, um, but these bands served a definite purpose in keeping the, the, the boys entertained, and, and, um, and they had ceremonial functions, too. So I think it was a good, they, they got their money back on the, the Navy got the money back on the investment that they made in, in um, in organizing this program for the, for the band. And, and do you think other than the trading, we needed a top trumpet or whatever personnel, the majority of them stayed on that ship their entire service? Or? I would say so. If you were assigned to a Navy ship, uh, it probably would take an act of Congress to get off that ship. Now, if your parent died and you were a, the sole only son, maybe they would be able to excuse you from that. Um, your tour would be on that. Un unless, right, unless that band was to be assigned to a different ship that, for some reason, <clears throat> or if the ship was decommissioned. And of course, during the time on board the ship, uh, their favorite topic was 
was trying to decide if the ship was going to go into dry dock for repairs at some point, and it never did. But they were always hopeful mm -hmm. that that would happen. But yeah, I think once assigned to a ship, now you could now you could have people assigned. I suppose people could rotate into the different bands. We never got to that point with this band. They were on it too, for too short of time. But I'm sure that could be that you have different periods of enlistment coming up that a, a person would rotate out and they'd have to bring somebody in. Or if a band member got sick or was ill, they'd have to replace them with somebody. How long have the Arizona been at Pearl Harbor Station there, do you know? Well, I don't know how frequently it, it made uh, stops in Pearl Harbor, but you could tell that things were happening, happening and they were bolstering the, the fleet presence in, uh, in Pearl Harbor because everyone knew what was going on. Uh, it, war was expected. Um, boys were enlisting <clears throat> in, for the war in Europe, but we, everyone knew what was going on too in, 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 uh, in Asia. So. When you visited, say the last time, was the Missouri there then? Because that's a sister ship. It's, it's at Pearl Harbor right now. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. You saw the Missouri. We, you would see it. We didn't go on it. No, but you could see it. You could see it, yeah. Yeah, it was there. I mean, we've been on it, but I'll, I'll talk to you later about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Well, anyway, no other questions. If you do have something, you just want to speak to me afterward, but thanks for attending the presentation. And um, I hope that those who are viewing it on television enjoy, the, enjoy it as well. Thank you.